Hey, in this segment, I wanted to do an addendum to my session on the Trinity. And um, as usual, when I was done, I figured, you know, Mark, you, you should have said this or that. But I'm fairly happy with what I said, but there was a few things I'd like to add, clarify. Um, three things, actually. In the beginning, I had mentioned that the Trinity is a sacred mystery, but that it is not a contradiction. And I um, wanted to elaborate on that a little bit. I remember as a young Christian, about 18, thereabouts, that I too heard the, you know, the analogy that the Trinity was like, one plus one plus one equals to one, and everyone laughed. And uh, the pastor went on to say that it was like heaven, heavenly arithmetic in reference to the uh, Trinity. And again, we all laughed. And uh, I understood then, I understand now at 62, that anything that we say that's an attempt at an analogy of the Trinity is going to have its limitations. Oh. But there's something about that, that that it implies that there is a contradiction and when, when we talk about um, when we use that particular analogy maybe it's just me but you know it was the laws of arithmetic are so clear that we know that one plus one plus one does equal to three. And since it's so math and logic are so closely aligned, I think that's a particularly poor analogy of the Trinity. And um, I say this gently, but, but firmly, that it's not... It's not heavenly arithmetic, that notion uh, of 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals to 1. It's, it enters more into the realm of the demonic, or the satanic. And I'm explain what I mean by that. Um, do you remember the first contradiction? It was in the garden. Satan contradicted God's word. And that is, he's a father of lies. And in, um, at the heart of the demonic, the demonic is chaos. In fact, there's even one realm called chaos magic. Or at the heart of sin and the demonic is the irrational. And of course, contradictions is a big part of irrationality and um, so that's why I think it's a particularly serious thing to attribute to the being of God contradiction his trinity again it's one thing to say that it's a, above reason it's a mystery but it's a, an entirely different thing to say that it's actually contradictory because one of the very attributes of God that he reveals about himself is that he is uh, a God of logic and that he delights in logic. Uh, he does, he's not restricted by human logic, but he is the one who is himself a logical being. He thinks in logical categories. He reveals himself as a God, the God of truth, not just in how he speaks, but in his being. He speaks himself as the God of truth. And as I mentioned, the Hebrew word for truth, emet, and the Greek word aletheia, both of them communicate um, logical consistency, not contradiction, the opposite, logical consistency, 
and a correspondence to real state of affairs. So we have to realize that when we impute to God contradictions, we're really implying that at the being of God, there is irrationality, uh, there, there is chaos, and these are aspects of the demonic, and we certainly don't want to be attributing those to God. Again, there's something sacred about a mystery, but there's nothing sacred about a contradiction. Because again, we see Satan doing that in the garden where he attempts to contradict God. You know, when we defend the iner inerrancy of Scripture, one of the main things that we are concerned about is showing that it does not contain contradictions in it. And what is the, the Bible but the inscripturated Word of God? And Jesus is the incarnate Word of God, God. So if the Word of God, which is divine, inspired by the Word of the Spirit of Truth, and we are keen to defend that it doesn't have contradictions in it, then we should be just as keen to defend the fact that God's being is not contradictory. Um, I'll just repeat myself that that law states that the law of non-contradiction says that um, A cannot be uh, A cannot be A and non-A at the same time in the same relationship. The classical formulation for the Trinity is that God is one in essence and three in persons. Okay, so we are not saying that God is one in essence and three in essence. That would be a contradiction. He's one in essence and three in persons. And it's, it, it took a lot of human effort over the years for people to come up with that formulation, which is biblical, and it sets the parameters for how should we should be able should communicate uh, orthodox truth about it and it should prevent us from falling into speaking about God um, you know we may not be me meaning to attribute anything bad about God we may be actually well-meaning by saying that the Trinity is contradictory but um, that's something that down through the ages the greatest minds who helped to formulate the Trinity they were very zealous to do it in a way that it did not communicate contradictions because they realized what that would imply about the nature of God and at its worst you know it would imply um, that the being of God is chaos and irrationality which is, is demonic, and um, that's a serious, serious charge. So we want to keep the Trinity pure of anything that um, is, um, you know, smells of smoke, or of the irrational, of um, anything that's uh, like that. So, the second point I wanted to make was that we could do, there, I wanted to challenge those of you who listen to this, that um, if you are still in college or young, and, and uh, to try to apply this, whatever academic field or vocation that you are in, uh, there is a rich explanatory power um, when it comes to apologetics uh, with the Trinity. Now, you don't have to choose between being an evidential apologist or presuppositional. I do both. But what I found was that um, 
the ways to apply the Trinity in apologetics are just innumerable. You name the science or uh, the discipline, academic discipline, and it can be applied. Um, just take poly science for, for an example. Um, you can show from a presuppos presuppositional perspective the how the Trinity uh, can explain um, how error how errors cre creep in and have very practical ideas have very practical um, uh, ramifications. Take for example uh, on the one hand socialism and communism, um, and on the other hand you have uh, its opposite anarchy. Now remember we talked about the triunity of God. You have the the philosophers talked about trying to mesh and find a um, middle ground or combination for the one and the many or the unity and the diversity. Well, what you have is that through, throughout di the different disciplines and throughout history, you have people elevating one of those, the diversity or the many on the one hand, or unity and the one on the other hand and squashing the other so for example what happened in the 20th century on, on all the monstrosities that happened uh, in the name of um, oneness the collective in communism and socialism um, the diversity of the one the the, the, the many got squashed under uh, this attempt to find unity and so on the, but on the other hand you have anarchy which nobody can live with where the um, you had the elevation of the many and the, and the squashing of the tossing out the one or uh, the authority so both of those extremes are um, not acceptable um, but we saw an unparalleled amount of slaughter and massacre uh, in the 20th century, the most bloodiest, the bloodiest century in the history of mankind. Because, um, in, in one sense, you could say they didn't grasp uh, the, the biblical concept of the Trinity. Uh, that's one way you could look at it as far as applying it to political science and how to treat humanity properly by keeping those two things unity and diversity the one and the many in a proper balance and that when you let one outrank the other and to squash the other then you, you can either have uh, chaos as a result or you're going to have uh, a form of unity such as in North Korea but where uh, the individual is squashed if not actually murdered and so that, that's, a, that's an example of poly science but you could take it on the macro level or micro level and apply it to the, the hard sciences you could take it and apply this notion of the one, the many, or the unity and diversity on a presuppositional type level and, and apply it to sociology, anthropology, and so on. And uh, take what I, the one example I did give in poli sci, sci and apply it to where you are and show, use your creativity and show how the Christian presupposition is not only superior to, um, but shows the intellectual bankruptcy of the um, non-Christian alternatives on a presuppositional level uh, as it applies to your particular discipline. Follow me? Okay. And, and then lastly, and very quickly, I, I, I made mention of this, but the, the, the distinction between God and us is this when it comes to relationships. We have relationships, and that's our part, part of 
a big part of our being made in, in God's image is being gregarious, having a wanting and needing relationships. It's not good for man to be alone. Whereas we have relationships, God is relationships. And that's what to me has been such a, a source of delight to consider and think about. We have relationships. He is relationships. He always has been. He is and always will be a tri-personal society. He is relationships. And uh, the word I keep coming back to is that's lovely. So thank you.